So it's my honor and privilege to introduce my friend Iyad El-Baghdadi, who will be joining us uh, from Oslo. He's the uh, co-founder of the Kwakabi Foundation, and I first got to know him 2011 during the Arab Spring when he became one of the most important sources on Twitter, first for creating open source maps uh, on the current situation in Libya, almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Then uh, he developed a whole new reputation for a series of tweets that became known as the Arab Tyrant Manual, which were scathingly funny and yet deadly serious uh, critiques of the common techniques and tropes used by leaders in the Arab world to uh, suppress dissent, free assembly, and democracy. We kept in touch over the years, and then one day about five years ago, he disappeared. Um, and it turns out that he was uh, picked up by police in the UAE one night, middle of the night, I believe, he can correct me on that, thrown into jail, stripped of his passport, and put on a plane to Malaysia, where he was forced to live stateless at an airport. Thankfully, he was given refugee status in Norway, and eventually his wife and son were able to join them. Uh, and he's been wor working hard there ever since. The last time I saw him was almost exactly a year ago at the Oslo Freedom Forum. Um, I actually wasn't attending the forum. I, I was in town for something else, but I promised I'd swing by to say hello. And while we were there, uh, he said he wanted to introduce uh, me to a friend of his named Jamel. Um, older gentleman, looked familiar, wasn't sure why. We chatted for a bit realized we both lived in Washington, D.C., and he said, well, let's get together for coffee sometime. That was Jamal al Khashoggi. And as most of you probably know, several months after that, uh, he was murdered uh, at the Saudi embassy, uh, Saudi uh, consulate in Istanbul. Uh, Iyad, who worked very closely with Jamal, uh, has been working ever since to try to understand what happened and how it happened. And because of those investigations, as reported by The Guardian not too long ago, he's been forced to go into hiding in Norway with protection from the Norwegian government because of a threat that was intercepted by a foreign government, uh, suggesting that the Saudis were about to go after him next. The work we do is important. It's, it can be extremely powerful and ideally influential, and, and Iyad's work has been all of that. But at the same time, work can come at a cost. And Iyad, I think, personifies the bravery uh, and honestly the heroism that's sometimes required to tell the truth and to tell the truth loudly, even when telling the truth put to you gravely under threat. So with that, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to welcome my friend, live via Skype from Oslo, Iyad El-Baghdadi. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Andy. Uh, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. You know, when you introduce me like that, I start kind of start to wonder, what am I doing with my life? You're doing good work, sir. That's what you're doing. <laughs> so, um, I mean, uh, the topic that I really want to talk about is how, like, the importance of open source investigations when it comes to covering authoritarian regimes. Um, the introduction that just came before Andy, uh, the gentleman was, was speaking about uh, how open source investigations serve a certain purpose because you're saying, don't trust me. This is, these are my sources. You can take a look at them and you can, you can confirm on your own. Uh, I think when we're covering uh, authoritarian regimes, dictatorships, um, there is another purpose. The purpose really is that these regimes are very highly opaque. You could not cover these regimes the same way that you cover a democracy. I mean, if you're actually covering Saudi Arabia, if you're a reporter or a journalist and you're covering Saudi Arabia the same way that you're covering the United States, 
then you're going to get played very bad. Uh, it's not just a, a, the the fact that they're actually opaque. They don't, uh, you know, it's, they don't exactly uh, share a lot of information. Uh, there isn't a lot of transparency in that in their societies in general. It's also that they can lie, uh, and it's also that they have unlimited resources, which means that you know they can they can actually change things around. They can they can run loops around you very easily. Uh, I remember, for example, a conversation that I had with a reporter, uh, a reporter I, I, I greatly respect. Uh, this was in December, I believe. This was uh, two months after the Khashoggi murder, and we were talking about what happened to Saud al-Qahtani, you know, Saudi Arabia's Prince of Darkness, the, the right-hand man of uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, Maybe not not very much known to a lot of people is the fact that Saud al-Qahtani is not only the person who was in charge of the Khashoggi murder, he was the, the person who was uh, directing the team. Uh, but also, Saud al-Qahtani is also the head propagandist. He's the troll master of the Saudi regime. Uh, so he has a certain footprint a certain kind of fingerprint on the propaganda that comes out from Saudi channels. This is one way in which we kind of notice whether he is actually working at, at the you know at the top of his team or whether he's taking a break. I mean, there is a not noticeable difference. At some point after the Khashoggi murder, there was a, a week or maybe 10 days in which we did notice that Saud al-Qahtani was not around. Uh, but then after that, he came back and he, he came back strong. And we could see that from the effect of his, of his work, really, from the output of the propaganda, uh, not only uh, uh, quantitatively, but also qualitatively. Um, and at that time, I mean, journalists who would want to actually confirm this, of course, there was there were news that, you know, Saud al-Qahtani has been sacked. Uh, he might be put on trial. You know, he's, he might actually be, you know, uh, uh, face the death penalty because he's going to be held responsible. He's going to be the fall guy for the Khashoggi murder. Um, and our own sources, anonymous sources, of course, this is another problem, of course, when you're covering, uh, covering authoritarian regimes, is that a lot of your sources are themselves anonymous, and they're taking great risks to speak to you in the first place. Uh, so, you know, like, if I'm speaking to a reporter and saying, you know, this is what's happening, I can't even share my source. Uh, and this, of course, becomes a problem. I have several sources, for example, who I, uh, you know, I refer to. I speak to them using fake names because they they are greatly under greatly at risk. Um, so there was the situation where we knew something happened, but then reporters, if, if we want to actually meet that the bar, the, the the bar of authentication that is required for something to be printed in a major newspaper. Uh, we're not going to meet it. You're not going to find, uh, I mean, people are asking me, like, can you actually prove uh, any of this? Can you actually prove with direct evidence? Uh, did he move? Well, well, did he get to your office? Did he travel? And I'm like, if you, if, if that's the bar that you're going to look at, if this is the system of authentication that you're going to follow, there are going to be loops around you. There's going to be months before you can confirm anything. And by the time you confirm that, they've already changed matters. They've already covered up. They've already done what they needed to do in order to get away with it or to get on with their next, to their next target. Uh, so this is something that, uh, of course, Jamal, being a, a journalist, understood very well. Jamal Shukji understood very well. Um, a bit of context here, the Saudi propaganda engine, there's, there are certain things that um, governments, authoritarian regimes generally, can hide. So they can, for example, if you're looking at satellite imagery, for example, that's open source intelligence. Um, but then they can hide some of their, they, they can actually hide certain things in bunkers, they can move the pieces of, uh, of weapon around. Uh, so there's something that they can actually stop doing, at least do differently. There is actually one thing that they cannot stop doing, which is propaganda. They're always going to be producing propaganda. Uh, so imagine the situation where, I mean, just, just, just for you to uh, 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 kind of understand that one project uh, that Jamal and I were working on, uh, you know, before his murder. Imagine the situation where you are in 1960s, let's say, 
and you can see a map of the zone. And on that map, you can see in real time all the propaganda that's being produced by the Saudi, by, by the uh, by the Soviet Union. Not only what the propaganda is, but where it is where it is produced, for who it is produced, uh, what it responds to what events in the world, and how it's being disseminated, how they're segmenting their audience, and how they're actually constructing narratives in opposition to other narratives uh, in the world. In other words, how are they handling news in use in the world? How are they spinning that to their, for their audience? And how, they're, how are they spending their audience, their internal audience, so that they're sending some message to certain people and, and, and others to another people? Of course, uh, it doesn't take much to see that that has tremendous intelligence value. Not only because we're going to, see, to be able to see what is important to them, but also because we'll be able to access a certain level, especially if you look at a prolonged period of time, we're going to be able to understand how to think. This is very important when you're actually uh, covering uh, dictatorships because, because there's such a dearth of actual information and direct evidence. Sometimes we have to rely upon what we know about them. Uh, a lot of these guys are known quantities. Uh, we know what their uh, what what the goals are. We know what the tactics tactics are. And if, I think there's also the fact that highly uh, central regimes and absolutist regimes such as Saudi Arabia today. Um, sometimes we project our own rationality on the actors involved. And what I mean by that is that um, sometimes we might think, oh, this is too stupid for them to. We might be thinking this is irrational for them to do. This is not useful for them to do. Uh, that might be true, but also it doesn't mean that they wouldn't do it. Uh, mainly because you are not speaking about. So, like, if you're speaking, for example, about uh, a democracy, generally, you're not even. It doesn't even have to be a democracy. Even if we're talking about some uh, authoritarian regime that has some real institutionalization, there is a certain uh, system of checks and balances. There is a certain. Uh, uh, the, the institutions basically are built in such, in such that should kind of guarantee some kind of rationality. Uh, this is not the case when you have an absolute history. Uh, it's not possible for you to think, oh, this is, this is not rational. There's a ra there is rationale in the end. Sometimes they would be doing things which are, uh, you know, which are rational. Behavior. It's actually more difficult to actually figure out, uh, you know, what what is the range of possibility when it comes to their actions. This is actually something that uh, was staring us in the face uh, when we were wondering what happened to Jamal, because we were thinking even Jamal himself was thinking of the worst case scenario is going to be rendition. The worst case scenario that his mind or on our mind is that they're going to kidnap him, and then they're going to force him to. to statement uh, in Saudi Arabia saying that he willingly went back to Saudi Arabia. Um, yes, and of course, uh, uh, sure uh, uh, with the reality really that actually went a lot further than that. So, I mean, uh, you cannot actually say this is too much. That do. Again, you're not talking about a rational institutional kind of uh, system of governance. So anyway, uh, Going to the propaganda and trying to basically try to and or reverse engineer their, their propaganda. Um, on, at, in 2011, the Arab Spring started. A lot of their propaganda was based on newspapers, TV stations, um, radio, basically traditional media, conventional media. With 2011 and the rise of social media, the tool of expression and uh, tool of uh, really dissent in the Arab world, they quickly realized to get that some slow they, they realized that they have to actually have their own propaganda engine uh, on social media. Uh, in Saudi Arabia in particular, the most popular social media was Twitter, more than Facebook. Uh, Twitter in 2012, I believe, um, even published some figures I think between July and August of 2012, there was a 3,000% increase in Twitter accounts from Saudi Arabia. Um, and of course, we speculated that this was not only Saudi citizens going, of course, a lot of it was Saudi citizens, but also it was a lot of government accounts being created. Um, the Saudi Twitter 
Well, so, so what happened since is that the Arab public sphere was on Twitter. The Arab, Twitter became the Arab public sphere. The Arab public sphere went from being an offline phenomenon to an online phenomenon. Uh, almost by accident, really, the offline phenomenon, uh, the offline space, uh, the, the real world space was closed. This is why we, I mean, this is why I ended uh, on Twitter, for example, because, you know, we, could, we, were, we lived in a, in a kind of way where that was the space of it to us. Uh, the study space is particularly dynamic because of the high penetration of Twitter in the country, but also the high degree of uh, engagement, I guess, by Saudi, Saudi users. Um, and even after, when I was arrested in 2014, it was because I used Twitter to express myself and to, to communicate with the world and to push out ideas. Uh, so in 2014, there was this assault on. Uh, Twitter users in Arab countries, but the Saudi space, and that continued until 2016, 2017, with the rise of Mohammed bin Salman and Saud al Qahtani. Um, and really, when Al Khashoggi was exiled in August of 2017, it was because the hammer was just about to fall. And in September 2017, uh, it did. A lot of influencers, Saudi influencers on social media who are very uh, influential when it comes to forming opinion. These are thought leaders and opinion makers in Saudi Arabia. They were arrested. Uh, we actually tabulated all sides in the um, uh, everyone who was arrested. The, if, if you actually tabulate all of their following, uh, uh, so all of their Twitter following, you get something like 50. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in for a second here. Could you uh, speak a little slower because the connection is getting a little choppy, uh, and so if you speak a little slower, we can make sure we're capturing everything you're saying. Sure. Uh, so we tabulated the the total number of followers of all those people who were arrested in in September 2017 and since. So there were waves of arrests in September. Uh, a lot of social social media influencers were arrested. In November, it was the Ritz Carlton incident. In March, uh, there was a gag order against uh, certain uh, feminists. The, of course, the, the feminists were not allowed to speak all the way from September of 2017. Uh, there were arrests in, in March of 2018, and then there were arrests of the women's rights activists in uh, in, in May of 2018. Uh, along with this phenomenon, so on the one hand, they're actually taking down legitimate voices, but at the same time, they were boosting their own uh, fake influencers. So they were basically building, they were constructing this propaganda engine in real time. Um, of course, this created a situation where um, they have total control over Arabic language Twitter. Uh, they can shut down communications, they can, they can shut down, uh, they can disrupt discussions, they can mob dissidents, they can deliver threats. That, they, can, they continue to do that even, even today, unfortunately. But this allowed us to actually watch the watchers, so to speak, because we can see they uh, took their propaganda engine and they put it online. Online means that we can actually see it in real time. We can actually see it by looking at their own Twitter output. We can know what hashtags they're pushing, why they're pushing them, how they're segmenting their audience, uh, how they're pushing different messages in response to real-world events, and we can also understand what's important to them and what's not. Uh, so this was an idea that she brought to me. Uh, this was a conversation that we had of uh, 2018. Uh, he gave me a call. He said, uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we create an Arab media monitor that would uh, kind of expose the internal narratives, the narratives used, the propaganda used by uh, Arab regimes. Uh, and of course, we talked about doing the uh, Arab newspapers, which are, of course, completely state-dominated. We talked about uh, their stations. Of course, we talked about their primary propaganda tool right now, which is social media. Um, unfortunately, Jamal was killed before we could get this rolling. In fact, I believe, uh, so he spoke to two different activists as far, as far as I know. I'm one of two that he spoke to about this. The last email exchange was, I think, a week before his murder. Um, and of course, we, we decided at the time, we cannot drop this. This is important. This is something that he wanted. 
but it's also so as very important for, uh, it's an important tool to supplement other tools when it comes to covering uh, dictatorships um, so we got to work on we started to actually um, um, we started to actually that and try to start start to, to construct a certain methodology um, and certain tools or certain hours to uh, to watch what they're doing and what they're saying um, and it was really in of 20, uh, 2019 that we thought, okay, this is something that really, um, really calls for this methodology to understand a very, very specific uh, uh, incident. And that was um, the, the whole uh, situation around Jeff Bezos's relationship with, him, with Mohammed bin Salman. Could you say that part about, again about Jeff Bezos? Jeff Bezos's relationship with uh, Mohammed bin Salman. The photos. So, you know, at the time, I mean, uh, to explain why this is, uh, why Jeff Bezos is part of this conversation in the first place, um, Jeff Bezos, at the time of the Khashoggi murder, must have been in quite uh, a bind. Because he is a man who had, at the time, uh, a personal relationship with Mohammed bin Salman. He had a direct relationship with Mohammed bin Salman. He had met him several times. He had uh, a lot, uh, a very extensive business interest in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he had projects in Saudi Arabia that were as yet not declared, enormous projects. Um, and I believe they were only a few weeks away from being declared, as in, uh, in fact, the Davos in the desert was supposed to be a, a moment when uh, Jeff Bezos would show up in Riyadh and declare that, you know, these are these amazing projects that we're doing with Saudi Arabia. But at the same time, Jeff Bezos happened to be the owner of the Washington Post and ultimately Jamal Khashoggi's boss. You know, this is a question that we ask ourselves many times. We don't have any, any proof, but it is quite possible that um, the Saudis only were emboldened to go after Jamal Khashoggi because they, they thought that they had, uh, they had the measure of control over Jeff Bezos. And so ultimately, when you had to go into hiding, it was because of the investigative work you were doing with Bezos's team to try to connect the dots between Jamal's murder, the Washington Post coverage of the murder, and the fact that suddenly a very embarrassing story came out about Bezos, which by all signs, according to your research, uh, as I understand it, was uh, pushed along by the Saudis. Yeah, so the Saudi involvement here is that in November, um, so in November they started, associate, in October, sorry, they started associated Bezos, associated Bezos with the Washington Post in a very public way. So they started saying that, you know, Washington Post and Amazon, but they're kind of the same thing because they're owned by the same person. So since you, we don't like the Washington Post, the Washington Post has had this campaign for justice for Jamal, Let's hit back at them. So they tried to catch Bezos' attention in November. And when that didn't work, they shifted to punishment. Uh, but yes, I mean, uh, and I sat down with my intelligence. Of course, one thing that I do is that would actually uh, do a risk assessment and say, okay, why is this happening? And we ended up with a list of, you know, eight kind of things that uh, might be directly, uh, a lot of these things are basically just about. Uh, but the top of the list was the Bezos investigation because it was the most public and potentially the most damaging form. So, on the one hand, you as an individual writer, it didn't take much for them to, to uh, for, uh, for you to get grabbed from your home and ultimately ending up in Norway. And now, of course, the threats you're currently experiencing. Well, at the same time, one of the wealthiest and most powerful men in the world and one of the most powerful news publishers in the world essentially gets targeted as part of the same operation. We're running out of time here, so I, I guess what I would ask how in the world 
do we first sec uh, secure ourselves, steal ourselves to combat disinformation from regimes that can fight in such a sophisticated fashion? Um, and secondly, how do, how do we keep up our how do we keep up our spirits? How do we do this without falling into despair and knowing that we will never have the same resources that they do? Yeah. So the first question, really, uh, I think uh, we need to speak to the to the to, to the companies that actually operate these these platforms. Uh, so I'm talking about Twitter, talking about Facebook, etc. I mean, they have a role to play here. Uh, their platforms are basically used as propaganda engines by certain regimes, but they're also used as activist engines by dissidents. Uh, and this is something which is important for these, uh, for these platforms to, to acknowledge. And I can tell you that Twitter has been quite uh, cooperative whenever, whenever we, we uh, fought for each other. But of course, there's a lot still to be done. The fact is that uh, Twitter continues to be the prime propaganda uh, weapon of not only the Saudi regime, but many regimes. And this is something that I think needs to do. Uh, as for the question of resources, I'm kind of um, comforted by the fact that you can have all the resources of the world that does not use us. But not what? Say that again? You can have all the resources in the world that still does not make you smart. People who have lots of power think that they're geniuses, and a lot of the time, they're not. In fact, sometimes simply because they have some resources, they're actually more arrogant, uh, they're more prone to make mistakes, and there's no one there to actually correct them and to say, you made a mistake. So it's essentially a matter of us finding all the mistakes, exploiting them, shaming them, and then continuing to do the good work as best we can. I think we have to expose them. I mean, people have a right to know. And a lot of these, uh, one thing that they do is that they complicate the story. Sometimes they, the story itself is complicated. Saudi Arabia, the Middle East is complicated anyway. And sometimes they overcomplicate the story to the point that people simply tune out. And I think this is where it's important for journalists to uh, take this down to the level of, this is why it's important for you and me. This is why it's important for the uh, Jamal's murder, for example, was one of those things that were very uh, evocative and very emotional. Um, and you know, there are many people, there are many Jamal Khashoggi. Jamal Khashoggi is not the only journalist who was who was murdered. Uh, it's just that it gives me some comfort to know that my friend's murder did not uh, that, that it led to this kind of awakening. Uh, that hasn't to, led to what? Say that part again. I said uh, Jamal's murder and what happened after that, I think it, it, it gives me some comfort to know that his murder really produced this kind of awakening. It was not a, for, a forgotten murder, in other words. It did produce an awakening as to the threats faced by dissidents, by journalists who are trying to cover a regime such as Saudi Arabia. Iyad, it's been an honor and pleasure talking to you today. Stay safe, my friend. Thank you. Take care. Now, I'm, I'm sure all of you noticed that the connection we had there was not optimal. Um, given his, his circumstances, though, it's also not a surprise. One of the questions I would have loved to have talked to him about was, so what security measures are you taking? How are you able to talk to me in the first place, given the situation you're in? And he's like, yeah, you've got to be kidding me. We're not talking about that. And that's the tough part of it, because on the one hand, as researchers and journalists and others who work in this space, we all need to have a stronger sense of our own safety, our own operational security, and the various measures we can take to protect ourselves, whether it's through encrypted communications, uh, anonymous use of the web through Tor and browsers like that. Um, and it's an important conversation to have, but the irony is that the people who are under the greatest threat and are doing everything they can to just keep moving forward, they ultimately are the, the best case studies in understanding how to do this. And yet, 
we can't ask directly. So 